In 1922, the up-and-coming naval architect William Francis Gibbs was tasked with his largest project yet. For years, Gibbs dreamed of building an American superliner that would rival the great ships of Europe. Instead, he would be tasked with refurbishing the second largest ship in the world, the German SS Vaterland. Gibbs' work on the project would be lauded as a great success, but the SS Leviathan would go on to prove an abject failure that nearly doomed Gibbs' hopes of ever building a great American superliner of his own. Ever since Kaiser Wilhelm II, grandson of Queen Victoria, attended Britain's Spithead Naval Review and marveled at White Star Line's RMS Teutonic in 1889, the German Empire endeavored to construct passenger liners that would outclass those of the United Kingdom. Essentially, the Kaiser was jealous of his grandmother's big fancy ships, and so he wanted to make his own big fancy ships. This one-upsmanship would ignite the rapid advancement in naval building that would produce ever larger and grander ocean liners and a tense geopolitical climate that would eventually help spark World War I. Eight years later, the North German Lloyd Line's 14,000-ton four-stacker, SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Gross, took the blue ribbon from Cunard's RMS Lucania. Germany would hold the record for the next decade, with Hamburg America Line's SS Deutschland, and later, North German Lloyd Line's SS Kaiser Wilhelm II. I'm noticing a naming pattern. With these ships, the Kaiser had the prestige he wanted, but Britain eventually clawed back the blue ribbon with the RMS Lusitania in 1907. Her sister, Mauritania, would go on to hold the record for the next 20 years. Between the speed of Cunard's Lusitania class and the size and luxury of White Star Line's Olympic class, Germany was in danger of losing the tenuous foothold on the North Atlantic passenger market they fought so hard to gain. A new set of record-breaking liners were needed. The big dick, I mean big ship battle, was on. In 1886, Albert Ballin joined the Hamburg America Line as head of the passenger department. He quickly rose to a leadership position at the company by the turn of the century. Ballin was a genius, frantically devoted to both the company and the national goal of advancing Germany's merchant naval fleet. Ballin recognized that in order to compete, they would need a trio of liners that would enable a weekly Atlantic Express service, and the Kaiser eagerly agreed. The first of this trio was the SS Imperator, laid down in 1910 and launched May 23, 1912, just over a month after the sinking of the RMS Titanic. At 52,117 tons, she was the largest passenger ship in the world. The second liner in the Imperator class was laid down in September 1911 at Balm and Voss in Hamburg. Designated hole number 212, the new liner was to be larger than her sister and featured a number of improvements on Imperator's original design. Hole number 212 was launched on April 3, 1913, in a ceremony led by Ruprecht, Crown Prince of Bavaria. The liner was given the nationalistic name of SS Vaterland, the German word for fatherland. At 53,500 tons, the SS Vaterland was the largest ship in the world. Her older sister, the SS Imperator, was proving a success with passengers despite flaws in her design that led to major stability issues, earning her the incredible nickname, Limperator. But most of these issues were resolved for the SS Vaterland. The liner had an overall length of 950 feet with a beam of just over 100 feet. She was powered by 46 coal-powered water tube boilers that drove four steam turbines, achieving a maximum speed of 26 knots and a service speed of 23 knots, exceeding Olympics 21 knots, but falling just short of the speed needed to challenge Mauritania's record. But the real showstopper was the Vaterland's lavish interiors, which were similar to Imperator's, but with some key improvements. While the Imperator's funnel casings followed the traditional path through the center of the ship, just like those on Olympic and Mauritania, the Vaterland's casings were split to run up the sides of the ship. This allowed sweeping public rooms that could run uninterrupted from one end of the ship to the other and gave significantly more space to her public rooms. Famed designer Charles Muse was in charge of her interiors, 
as he had been on many previous Balin liners. Like her older sister, Baudelin was given a grand Ritz-Carlton restaurant on her lounge deck that replicated the famous hotel restaurant in New York. The grand oval-shaped room flowed seamlessly into her spacious winter garden and then to the grand foyer, which contained a grand staircase and her lifts. This space then opened up to her palatial social hall that featured a large raised stage in the space occupied by the center funnel casing on the Imperator. Another feature was her grand swimming pool, which spanned two decks and was decorated with large marble columns and accents, significantly more palatial than the British competition. She also boasted two massive Kaiser suites that featured two bedrooms each, a sitting room, breakfast room, a private veranda, ensuite bathrooms, and a service pantry. Though the Imperator class was only a few thousand tons larger than the Aquitania and the Olympic class, and shared a similar rectilinear exterior design, the Imperator, and especially the Vaterland, gave a greater impression of size with her bulky, towering superstructure. The Titanic disaster was still a very recent memory, and a number of improved safety measures were installed to accommodate the ship's intended capacity of 4,050 passengers and 1,200 crew. She was equipped with a powerful spotlight that could be used to spot icebergs, though it's doubtful this would really have made much of a difference. More meaningfully, she was equipped with 83 lifeboats, more than enough to accommodate everyone on board. Ballin also paid particular attention to the ship's third-class accommodations. Immigration was still a major business at the time, and Ballin knew that if lower-class passengers had a pleasant crossing, they would write to their friends and family back in Europe and tell them what a joy it was to cross with the Hamburg America line. The SS Vaterland sailed her maiden voyage on May 14, 1914, only a few weeks before Cunard's RMS Aquitania. She was truly the culmination of the North Atlantic building race that defined the early 20th century. She was the largest, most palatial liner passengers could sail on, a testament to Albert Ballin's obsessive dedication. But she was only able to complete a tiny handful of voyages before war broke out only a couple months later. With the North Atlantic now a war zone, the Hamburg America Line feared it would be too dangerous to bring their flagship home. They chose to keep the liner laid up at their terminal in Hoboken, New Jersey in the neutral United States. This decision would ultimately prove a mistake. The Vaterland remained laid up in Hoboken for three years as the war raged on. The United States remained neutral at the outset of World War I. Large portions of the population didn't think it was wise to enter into what was seen as just another European war. But President Woodrow Wilson was eager to enter the war on the side of the Allied powers. While many British liners were requisitioned to serve the war effort, the RMS Lusitania continued to offer passenger services. On May 7, 1915, she was torpedoed by a German U-boat, killing 1,198 passengers and crew, including 128 American citizens, sparking outrage in the United States. Germany's policy of unrestricted submarine warfare played a major role in turning public sentiment against Germany and the Kaiser. But the United States remained neutral as the war dragged on. Then, in January 1917, a secret communication sent by the German Foreign Office to Mexico, known as the Zimmerman Telegram, was intercepted and decoded by British intelligence. The communication proposed a military alliance between Germany and Mexico if the United States entered the war and promised to return Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico in exchange. The telegram ignited a firestorm in the United States and Congress voted to declare war on Germany on April 6, 1917. The Vaterland, along with numerous other German ships laid up in American ports, were immediately seized. When the United States Shipping Board took possession of the Vaterland, they found that she was one of the only ships not to have her engines and equipment damaged or destroyed by her German crew. It was said they couldn't bring themselves to destroy their beloved ship. They were sent to an internment camp in Hot Springs, North Carolina, where many of them died of typhoid fever in the summer of 1918. Though she escaped sabotage, 
The years of inactivity left her in desperate need of repairs in order to bring her back into operation. She was turned over to the Navy in June 1917 for conversions to a troop ship. Obviously, the name Vaterland would not be suitable. President Woodrow Wilson was asked what the new name should be. He responded, Why, that's easy. A Leviathan. It's in the Bible. Monster of the Deep. The USS Leviathan's size and speed would be a key asset to the U.S. war effort. She made 10 round trips between Hoboken and Brest, France, at first carrying 7,000 to 10,000 troops for voyage. But later, it was decided that troops could share bunks, taking turns. That worn bunk system. Ew. This practice raised her capacity to an astonishing 14,000 troops per voyage. She was also given a custom dazzle paint scheme to help camouflage her from German submarines. By the time the armistice was signed on November 11, 1918, she had completed 10 round-trip voyages and transported 120,000 troops to the war in Europe. After the armistice, she underwent a minor overhaul and was painted gray. She would sail nine additional voyages, repatriating U.S. soldiers, and finished her last voyage on September 8, 1918. On October 29, 1918, she was decommissioned and handed over to the U.S. Shipping Board and was laid up again in Hoboken while her new owners debated what to do with their great German sea monster. The United States retained ownership of the Leviathan under the Treaty of Versailles. On December 17, 1919, the International Mercantile Marine or IMM, signed a contract to oversee her conversion back to a passenger liner for the United States. Initial bids for the project were incredibly high, and it was decided best to wait for a more favorable bid. To further complicate the project, the original blueprints were not turned over by the Germans under the treaty. They demanded $1 million for the plans, which was considered outrageous, and a new set of plans were drawn up for the ship instead. The project was eventually transferred from the IMM to Gibbs Brothers, later known as Gibbs and Cox, the company that was led by famed naval architect William Francis Gibbs, who was eager to grow his new company and commission his own American superliner. The project would be an opportunity to prove his new company and help establish America's role in the North Atlantic passenger trade. In late 1921, a new bid for the project from the Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company in Virginia was accepted for $6,135,575. The Leviathan began her 14-month conversions in April of 1922. The refit would convert her boilers from coal to oil. Her hull was strengthened and her wiring and plumbing were all replaced. Her interior conversions were led by New York architects Walker and Gillette, though most of her lavish original designs were maintained. Her paint was also updated, giving her a patriotic red, white, and blue funnel scheme. Upon completion, her size increased to 59,956 tons, and her speed averaged 27.48 knots in speed trials. The Americans calculated tonnage differently from the British and would go on to heavily advertise the Leviathan as the largest and fastest ship in the world. This was, of course, not true. The Mauritania still maintained the speed record, and Leviathan's younger sister Bismarck, now the White Star Line's Majestic, was slightly larger. The Leviathan would be operated by the newly founded United States Lines. The line was established to operate the many German liners seized by the United States after the war. The Leviathan's maiden voyage as an American liner departed on July 4, 1923. A very patriotic choice of a date. Her 13 years of service with the United States were largely uneventful aside from an encounter with a winter storm in 1924. She was battered by 90-foot waves and winds that reached 100 miles per hour, forcing her to roll by up to 20 degrees. The harsh winter storm smashed 11 portholes and injured 32 passengers. The Leviathan was immediately popular early in her career, but her success was short-lived. The passenger trade changed significantly in the 1920s, especially after the Immigration Act of 1924 greatly reduced the number of people allowed to immigrate to the United States. The Leviathan had two major factors playing against her. The first was the prohibition of alcohol passed in the United States in 1920. 
The act mandated that U.S. registered ships were considered U.S. territory and were barred from serving alcohol on board, making them dry ships. This put the Leviathan at a major disadvantage in the saturated transatlantic market because, well, people like to drink on ships. It also didn't hurt that there were two nearly identical copies of her operated by Cunard and White Star Line that both served alcohol, came with the prestige of their long-established British operators, and were generally known to be more fun party ships. Leviathan was low-key known as the more buttoned up of the three, appealing to an older, more conservative crowd. But all this was minor compared to the second issue that plagued the Leviathan. Without running mates that could match her size and speed, the Leviathan could only offer a monthly transatlantic service. The Cunard Line and White Star Line each had their own trio of express liners. This allowed both lines to offer a weekly express service to New York. For many, when it came time to book passage, the United States lines wouldn't even come to mind. And if it did, travelers would have to wait weeks to set sail. On top of all that, the Leviathan was massive and expensive, and the inexperienced United States lines were ill-equipped to operate such a liner. The line accumulated massive amounts of debt throughout the 1920s, and the stock market crash of 1929 made the situation considerably worse. At the end of the decade, the line was sold and restructured a number of times. By this time, the Leviathan was seen as a major burden to the company, and they demanded that the U.S. government either retake the ship or provide subsidies for her operation. Since 1929, she had lost $75,000 per round trip, but the situation for the liner was only growing worse, due to the Great Depression and a lower number of passengers traveling to Europe. In 1933, the government stipulated that the Leviathan had to remain in service and complete another five round trips. She underwent a $150,000 refurbishment, and in the following 1934 season, she lost another $143,000, sailing barely half full on each voyage. Finally, the line paid $500,000 to the U.S. government to allow them to retire the liner everyone now saw as a giant money pit. She was maintained until 1936 and was sold for scrap in 1937. On January 26, 1938, she sailed her final voyage to a scrapyard in Scotland, though her scrapping was delayed by World War II and was finally completed in 1946. The Leviathan carried 250,000 passengers under the United States lines and never made a profit for her owners. Despite early promise and optimism, she was ultimately seen as a failure and convinced many that superliners should be left to the Europeans. William Francis Gibbs was praised for his work on the project, but the failure delayed any hope of a new American superliner until after World War II, when Gibbs would finally get the opportunity to build his great American liner. The SS Leviathan is a fascinating missed opportunity, and it's hard not to imagine what would have happened if her career wasn't hampered by the war. The ball and trio, if operated as intended, would undoubtedly have given a great deal of competition to the British liners. The Vaterland was a combination of the race to build ever larger and more lavish ships. She was a beautiful marriage of pre-war opulence and innovation. Her American owners failed to let her shine, but in the end, circumstance sealed her fate. Ultimately, the one-upsmanship that created her led to the war that turned her over to a foreign power and destroyed the world she was designed for. Nevertheless, she was a marvel that well deserves her place in history. So what do you think of the Vaughn Trio? They seem pretty divisive. That eagle, anyone? But I really like them. Let me know in the comments down below what you think. Which one's your favorite? Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, hit that like button and, you know, why not subscribe while you're at it? It'll be the perfect Christmas gift for your favorite Ocean Liner YouTuber. All right, everyone, that's all I've got. Until the next one, be nice to people.